The scripture reading for this morning, taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, beginning verse 44. Children of God, hear now God's word for us this day. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I believe it's been a a valuable, although difficult, journey that we have been making through this, this sacred season of Lent, reflecting upon what is known as the seven last words of Christ, or the seven words of Christ from the cross. You recall the first week of Lent when Jesus prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We recall that day how Jesus was praying for the forgiveness of those who were putting him to death and how his mercy and his prayer extends also to all of us for the forgiveness of our sins. The second week, we pondered, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. The wonderful promise that Jesus made to that repentant thief on the cross next to his own. I tell you the truth. The third week, we discussed two of the words from the cross. First, how the living water himself cried, I am thirsty, even knowing our own bodily pain. And also that week, how Jesus made a new family when he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to his his best friend, his closest follower, John, And here is your mother. He created a new family, not of blood, but of spirit. A family in which we all belong. The next week then, we pondered the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We remembered that day how the one who knew no sin of his own became sin for us. Jesus on the cross became your sin and mine. And in that sinfulness, the Holy Father, the uh, God our Father, could not look upon him. So he turned his face away, and Jesus experienced the forsakenness of God. Forsaken meaning turning away of the face. He experienced that separation from God his Father, that penalty of our sin, the debt that we owed. We know when he cried, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was because he became my sin and yours, paying sin's penalty. And with that, that separation, that unspeakable anguish endured, then Jesus declared, it is finished. And our brother Chuck brought that message to you last week. It is finished. Not a cry of resignation like, well, I'm dying, it's all over. The exact opposite. It was a cry of victory. It is finished. It is accomplished. The work of forgiveness for humankind is accomplished. And then this morning, as we consider Jesus' final word, we are faced with a particular challenge, for today is indeed what we have needed to celebrate as Palm Sunday, the day of Jesus' great procession into the capital city of Jerusalem. But in addition, this day is also, at the same time within the Christian church, referred to as Passion Sunday, the start of Holy Week, the days in which we remember and relive Jesus' Last Supper with his closest followers in the upper room, and then his arrest, his torture, his death by crucifixion, and his burial. 
sisters and brothers, in order for us to experience next Sunday morning the full impact and significance of Christ's resurrection, we must make this journey of Holy Week in its entirety, with the highs and the lows, for there is no Easter triumph without the suffering commemorated in Holy Week. There is no crown without the cross. And so we must endure the sharp contrast of this day, the palms and the passion. The Bible tells us it was from 12 o'clock noon, that would be the sixth hour, since the day began at 6 a.m. It was about the sixth hour, 12 noon until 3 p.m., the darkness came over the whole land because the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, the way into the temple, holy of holies, the holiest place, a part of the temple into which only one man, the high priest, could go once a year. That's it, one man once a year, representing the sins of his people and receiving the forgiveness of God on their behalf. The holy of holies. And what separated that, that small space, the holy of holies, what separated that from the rest of the temple was a thick, heavy curtain. History, tradition tells us that the curtain, the material, was a man's hand breadth thick. The material itself was approximately four inches thick. Think how thin my stole is, this material. Four inches thick, that's how heavy this curtain was, separating God from humankind, of course, representing our sin. And yet the Bible tells us, and in another gospel, it says not only was the, the te um, temple veil, the curtain was torn in two, it was torn from top to bottom. It was the work of God tearing this, this barrier apart, that all may now approach God in faith through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. The curtain was torn in two, access to God received. And then with his work on earth completed, with his mission of providing for our salvation accomplished, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, remember when he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? That intimate relationship had been temporarily broken. My God, and now with salvation's work accomplished, it is finished, he returns to that intimacy saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands I place my spirit. I hand over my spirit. I entrust my spirit into your care. We must not miss the contrast here. For back in that same Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 44, Jesus had said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to, betrayed, going to be betrayed into the hands of men. And here, with that prophecy being fulfilled, with Jesus having been betrayed into the hands of men, he now commits his spirit into the loving hands of God, his Father. This final word from the cross, this final word of Jesus, is in reality such a beautiful prayer, isn't it? A prayer of consecration, a prayer of, of dedication. And it is taken from Psalm 31, verse 5. Interestingly, this verse from Psalm 31 was the same prayer that every Jewish mother taught her child to pray the last thing at night. Just as we perhaps were taught to pray as children, maybe we even teach our children and grandchildren to pray, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Just as we do that, so the Jewish mother taught her child, taught her children to pray, into thy hands I commit my spirit. 
And so did Jesus pray, calling out in a loud voice, Scripture tells us. Not just a cry, not a whisper, not a whimper, with a loud voice, dying with a prayer of confident faith on his lips. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The Scripture continues very simply, as we have heard. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Even on the cross, Jesus died as a child falling asleep. As a child falling asleep in his father's arms. Fully at peace. No hint of anguish as he dies. Only complete trust in his father, into whose hands he commits his spirit. The Roman centurion, seeing what had happened, was deeply moved. The Bible tells us he was compelled to praise God and to proclaim, surely this was a righteous man. Scottish Bible commentator William Barclay interpreted this final word from the cross this way. This proves that the crucifixion was not an accident, not a mistake, not an unfortunate slip up. To the contrary, it was the deliberate self-offering of the Son of God. Now earlier, back in John chapter 10, Jesus had said, he had declared to his followers, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. And then in John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus taught, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That he lay down his life. Jesus' death was entirely and absolutely in every way voluntary. Even in Matthew chapter 26, beginning verse 53, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked his disciples, Do you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels, the whole hosts of heaven, who will come to my defense? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? And then a little later, while he was standing before Pontius Pilate in one of those pseudo-trials, Jesus also made it clear that Pilate was not condemning him, but that he, Jesus, was accepting his death. John 19, verse 10, Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Jesus was not the poor victim of circumstance. He wasn't dragged unwillingly or without understanding to his death. At any point along the way, even at the very end while on the cross, he could have turned back, called upon the angels, and saved his own life. But Jesus laid down his life because he chose to do so. And why? Because he loves us. Because he would rather die for us and for our salvation than live forever without us in heaven. Jesus didn't lose his life, friends. He gave it for you and for me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, even in these quiet moments, we need to pause to let the depth of these words, the power of these words that you spoke from the cross, sink in even a little bit further into our hearts. Lord God, help us to 
to ponder even more that truth that you would rather die for us and for our salvation than live forever without us in heaven. We will spend all eternity praising you, giving you our thanks, all glory and honor. And for today we pray, with thanksgiving, we pray that you will continue the good work you've begun in each of us, that you will continue your work, drawing us even closer to you, which means then we're all going to end up even closer to each other. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for what you are continuing to do in your Holy Spirit. And thank you for what you will yet do in each of us, in all of us, and through us. Again, Lord Jesus, to the everlasting glory of your name. Amen. <laughs>